Can I tell you another story about the complaints department? I hope your answer is yes. <laughs> and I hope you're taking a moment to get comfortable. And uh, while you're doing that, I will tell you that this podcast and these stories are supported by patrons. So if these stories feed you and you would like to offer something back and become a patron too, you can do that on patreon.com forward slash can I tell you a story, which is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash can I tell you a story and you will receive bonus stories and other mysterious things, um, including my endless thanks, literally endless. You can read about that on the site. Um, that's all. Let's begin. It's story time. Laurie walks down the laneway in the soupy dark, feeling like a hollow thing, a vessel containing only empty space. She's tall, stylish without really trying. Her black snakeskin heels make her taller. She feels untethered, adrift, like she's not really touching the ground. Around her neck is a fine golden chain with three small stars hanging from it, a way to remind herself that there's more out there, more outside her than the emptiness within, that even in outer space, in all that vacuum, something shines. She slows her pace, eyes following the bricks beside her, gaze trailing over uninspired graffiti, over torn and faded posters for events no one remembers. The darkness presses in. She squints not totally sure what she's looking for. A gap in the bricks, some kind of letterbox, easy to miss in the gloom. The man she overheard said it was obvious, but is that daytime obvious? Tonight, there is no moon. Laurie drifts down the laneway in the same way she drifts around the edges of her life, like a tumbleweed in the dark. A midnight kind of tumbleweed, because Laurie is a midnight kind of person. Darkness feels easier, it demands less of her than daylight. She's tumbling herself into nothingness and she doesn't know how to stop. Every thought she swallows grows the emptiness. Everywhere she goes to find meaning seems to be equally empty. What's it all for? The question follows her everywhere and Laurie doesn't know how to find the answer. It's hard to keep going when reasons disappear like soap bubbles, ephemeral, shining and then gone. Maybe hope is like an hourglass, she thinks. What happens when the sand runs out? but it hasn't run out, not yet. Laurie has a letter in her hand, written on dotted paper sealed into a stray envelope found in the kitchen junk drawer. She's halfway along the laneway when she finds what she's looking for and sighs, tension and relief both fighting for space in her body. The letterbox is real, and the solid, tangible fact of the metal slot set into the brick wall of the lane means hope keeps going. The sand runs a little slower through the hourglass. Laurie pushes her letter into the complaints department letterbox, under the flap that keeps out the weather. If she'd looked over the wall, she'd have seen there was nothing on the other side but an empty plot of land, all cracked concrete and weeds. She would have wondered, hope dwindling faster, where the complaints go, if pushing them through the letterbox is as meaningless as everything else. But she doesn't look over the wall. She walks fast the rest of the way down the lane, pulling her long coat around herself, heels clicking a heartbeat on the uneven path. Laurie's letter materialises out of nothing in a pile of papers on the floor of the complaints department next to the junior manager, Ewan's desk. It causes a minor landslide coming to a stop next to his foot. He picks up the envelope and opens it absently, reads her words and sighs. It's been a week full of complaints, of existential pain, and sometimes the weight of the world's angst is a lot to bear. The mood in the complaints department office is sombre and tired. Laurie's letter is a series of questions. What's the point? What does her life mean? What is she for? This life feels faded and faint, brittle, like dried grass. Does her life mean anything? She's tried to make her own meaning, tried to decide this is what it means, but the meaning never sticks. It ends up feeling just as empty as everything else. Ewan puts the page down on his desk and looks up. Two of the three field officers are in. Silas is sitting at his desk like a statue, holding a pencil like he's about to write something in the air, 
staring at nothing. Simone is drawing triangles on a piece of paper, ignoring for the moment the pile of complaints waiting in her in-tray that sits on Ewan's desk. There's an ongoing battle about the in-trays between Ewan and all three field officers. He maintains that keeping their in-trays on his own desk is far more economical and efficient as he doesn't have to get up and go to three different desks in order to give them their next jobs. They maintain that he's being incredibly lazy and should welcome the chance to get up and stretch his legs, to which Ewan points out that he's kindly offering them the chance to get up and stretch their own legs, and nowhere near as often as he'd have to get up given there's three of them and only one of him. So far, Ewan is winning. Ewan thinks for a while before placing Laurie's complaint in Sadie's tray. Silas is the obvious choice. He cultivates an air of brooding mysteriousness. Not that you'd know watching him right now, pencil poised in midair. He's also a midnight kind of person, practiced at this particular kind of existential angst. He'd understand. But sometimes meaninglessness doesn't need empathy. Sometimes it needs something completely different. Sadie is completely different. The door bangs open and Silas jumps and drops his pencil. Oops, sorry! Sadie blows into the room like a breath of spring air. She's carrying a box in both hands. Scones, she announces, putting the box down on the corner of her desk. There's jam and cream, too. You lot look like you could use a Devonshire tea break. And someone opened a window. It stinks of hopelessness in here. What's going on? Simone looks up. You're a dear, she says. Weight of the world's complaints is what's going on in here. We're all a bit tired. Where do you get the scones? Happy customer, says Sadie. Why do you get all the happy ones? Silas looks at the pencil rolling across his desk as if he'd never seen it before. It's my winning personality. Five minutes in my company and people can't help but be happy. And you wouldn't know what to do with a happy one. Here, have a scone. Silas looks out of place with a scone in front of him on a white napkin. Well, your latest doesn't sound very happy, says Ewan, gesturing to Sadie's in tray. I hope you can work your magic with her. Sadie picks up the page and reads it while chewing a scone. Poor thing, she says. Meaninglessness is a hard thing to bear. What do you know about meaninglessness? asks Silas. You seem like you've never had a day of angst in your life. I'm not asking to be rude. I genuinely want to know. You practically ooze life and purpose. Like my scone, says Sadie, watching jam and cream squash out the side as she takes a bite. Oozing all over the place. I'm just in the world, she says, with her mouth full. That's all. I'm here, and I solve people's problems with them, and that's the sum total of my secret. You're a my little pony, all sparkles and fluff. And I have an unprecedented success rate. Ponies are just the tip of my iceberg, Silas. An iceberg made of ponies, Simone helps herself to a scone. Are they frozen? Do they rotate and take turns at the top? How do the ones on the bottom breathe? Sadie laughs. Suspend your disbelief at the door, please. A short while later, a hook would appear just inside the door with a plaque over it that says exactly that. Suspend your disbelief here. No one was ever sure who put it there. What are you going to do with our midnight complainer? asks Simone. Oh, I don't know, says Sadie. Take her to the carnival, probably. I've been wanting to go. Two birds, one stone. Maybe I can win her a My Little Pony at one of the stands. She winks at Silas, who rolls his eyes. Oh, says Ewan, behind his scone, deflating. I was going to ask if you'd like to come to the carnival with me. On a date? asks Simone. She lowers her voice to a still audible whisper. Must be getting serious, she says to Silas. No rule against going twice, says Sadie, smiling at Ewan, who blushes, jam on his chin. Laurie stands in her kitchen, opening her mail in the red square of late afternoon sunlight coming through the window. She's feeling sluggish and distracted by the sound of hope ticking through the hourglass, running out. She picks up an envelope addressed to her in a hand she doesn't recognise. But all hands are hands she doesn't recognise. No one writes letters by hand anymore. Inside is a gilt-edged invitation to the carnival that evening, with the instruction to wear something green and wait by the entrance. Green? Who wears green? Laurie dresses mostly in blacks and whites, creams and charcoals, carefully neutral, everything going with everything. She smiles a wry smile. She complained about how things were. She supposes she can't really complain about what happens next. 
In the back of her wardrobe, she finds a green silk shirt with the tags still attached, bought so long ago the shop she found it in is long gone, transformed into a toy shop selling ethically made wooden toys to expensive-looking mothers with expensive-looking children who ignore them in favour of bright-coloured plastic. The silk feels cool in her fingers, the colour reminding her of the shiny, iridescent bodies of beetles. She takes off the tags and puts on the shirt, black tailored trousers, heels. The front door clicks shut softly behind her as she goes to find out what happens next. Laurie waits at the gates of the carnival a seasonal circus with a shifting sideshow that comes to town in the springtime most years. Laurie has lived in the town most of her life, and this is the first time she's come. Tents surround the big top like a crop of multicoloured mushrooms full of promises. Be astonished, they say. Be astounded. Be amazed. The carnival smells of popcorn and hope. Laurie holds her invitation in her coat pocket, damp from the sweat of her palms. She's surprised to find she's afraid. She watches people walking in, in twos and threes and families, all passing under the archway above the gate like they're entering another world. Their eyes shine, they look full up with the expectation of transcendence. Laurie wonders what her face says, if it holds any of the anticipation that these people's faces hold. Their vessels are full of longing for wonder, belief that they will find it. Hers feels full of nothing. A young-looking woman stops in front of Laurie and holds out her hand. Laurie, I'm Sadie. Laurie takes the offered hand and smiles her best. I'm so happy to be here, smile. And she's surprised when Sadie doesn't smile back. You don't have to do that here, says Sadie. The carnival is like a mirage. Everything here is a reflection of something else. Everyone here, like a mirror ball, catching sparks from everyone else and throwing them back until we're all dizzy and delighted. This, one night, will never come again. Be in it. See what happens when you let the mayhem meet your madness, exactly as it is. I I don't think I know what you mean, says Laurie. Doesn't matter, says Sadie, and Laurie frowns to find she believes her. It doesn't matter. Thanks for accepting my invitation, says Sadie. Shall we go in? She takes Laurie's arm and guides her under the archway and into the crowd of tents and people. Welcome to Wonderland, she says, and her face mirrors the rest of the crowd, full of longing and wonder. Laurie can't look at the faces for long, and instead she looks at the ground. The evening is like a kaleidoscope. Laurie takes it all in in snatches, the shifting scenes dizzying, her only anchor, Sadie's steady presence, at her side. She sees shysters rigging games of skill and chance with practised ease. Punters seem to know they haven't a chance, and still hope shines in their faces. Perhaps this one time, this lucky shot. She sees children, mad with sugar, running figure eights through the legs of the crowds, begging for ride tickets. Just one more, please, just one more time. She sees the bead curtain swaying over the entry to a fortune teller's tent, a pair of black-lined eyes painted over the door, offering glimpses of the future. She sees performers dressed in sequins and feathers, bending in impossible shapes, breathing coloured fire walking on their hands. Slapstick clowns tumble and fall in front of her and Laurie laughs, and to her own ears her laughter sounds too loud, the sound scattering like startled birds from her lips. The carnival is bright and shining and larger than life, and she sees the way the crowd leans in, drinking something from the spectacle. Laurie feels like a ghost in the midst of it all, here without really being here, like being offered water and not knowing how to drink. Laurie knows everything she sees is a beautiful facade, shiny on the outside, hiding the machine behind it. She knows that in the morning these people will look just like everyone else, tired, makeup smudged, no longer glittering or sparkling, ordinary morning people doing ordinary morning things. Nothing she is seeing is real. Why did you bring me here? Why do you think? I don't know. All these people are wanting to be taken somewhere else for a while. They have to know all of this is an illusion, but they buy into the dream. Perhaps you're trying to teach me to let go of searching, to believe the fantasy? Nothing we're seeing is real. Isn't it? Sadie looks at her. Perhaps I just wanted to see the carnival, she says, and I thought you might like to come too. Laurie looks at her. Really? But 
I thought you were going to do something about my complaint. What makes you think I'm not? Oh, look, those two girls in tutus are riding coloured ponies. How do you think they make them those colours? I think I want to go home, says Laurie, but she stays by Sadie's side. As the sun rises, Laurie and Sadie are sitting at the edge of a large grassy field full of carnival tents. Things look different with the light bleeding over the edge of the world. The debris of the night before is scattered through the grass. To Laurie, after the warm lights, the press of excited bodies, the shouts and music and laughter, it looks broken and sad. This is the real face of it, she says, behind the facade. Sadie smiles. Is any of it less real? Any of it not real? It's all part of it. Last night was just as real as this morning. Why should this mean more than what came before? What if the endless question of meaning is the wrong question to be asking? How old are you? You mean that in this light I look about 25 and my thoughts are too deep for this end of the day? I... yes. Think again, says Sadie. This end of the day is the perfect time for questions so deep you could drown in them. Laurie was quiet, thinking again. Here's another thought to think, says Sadie, flopping backwards onto the grass and staring at the clouds, turning pink above them. Why does it matter that nothing matters? Laurie groans and fishes in her bag for her sunglasses, which she plants firmly on her face. Sadie grins. Fortified against hard questions. No one can see you now. She looks up as a figure crosses the field towards them. Except him, she says. He sees everybody. It's Silas. He sits down next to them, doing his brooding and mysterious act. Laurie eyes him through her sunglasses. This is Silas, says Sadie. You should probably listen to him. For a while, Silas says nothing. Listen to him say what? Wait for it, says Sadie. Stop looking at where meaning isn't, says Silas. You're looking for the gaps. You're looking for the holes. You're always searching for confirmation that you're right while a corner of you hopes desperately that you aren't. You're waiting for meaning to happen to you. You need to go out and happen to meaning. You can't decide what's meaningful in your head. You have to feel what's meaningful with your heart, and you can't do that from the sidelines. All of this is meaningless, theoretical nothing. It's no wonder you feel empty. Thoughts won't fill you up. Fuck you, thinks Laurie. But she says, less thinking, more doing. Doing what? Silas grins like it can read her thoughts. Doing anything. Got to be worth a try, wouldn't you say? And if it doesn't work, well, you know where to find us. I'm hungry, says Sadie. Want to come and get donuts for breakfast? Keep the carnival going just a little bit longer? Ugh, no. I think I'm going to sit here a while and think about this. What did Silas just say? Less thinking, more doing. Get up. They pull Lurry to her feet. Taking an arm each, they walk across the field in the direction of town, and Laurie lets them, desiring strong black coffee and cradling a small spark of hope that perhaps this mysterious, brooding man and this young, annoyingly effervescent woman might know something she doesn't. Hey, Laurie, says Sadie. What? What happens when the hourglass runs out? Sadie smiles at her. You turn it over. Thanks for listening. I want to go to the carnival. I hope that you enjoyed this story. And if you did and you want more, perhaps you'd like to become a patron. Patrons receive bonus stories and other things, including my endless thanks, which you can find out more about on patreon.com forward slash can I tell you a story. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash can I tell you a story. Until next time.